time to be part of this special event. In just a few minutes, Todd Baker will be presenting for 27% this year, which is based on the popular series of articles in the Nonprofit Times. This session will touch on the five most dangerous trends facing charities today and how to counter them with 13 proven strategies. Before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping items I'd like to discuss. To be conscious and respectful of everyone's time, all attendees are muted during this session. If for some reason you have the phone icon in your dialog box, please, please physically mute your phone. We encourage everyone to type your questions and we will be answering them at the end of the presentation. Also, please note that your dialog box will minimize by default after a few minutes, but you can expand it by clicking on the orange box in the upper right-hand side. We are scheduled for an hour, but we will leave time at the end open for questions and answers. At this time, I'd like to present Todd Baker, Vice President and Senior Strategist for Grizzard Communications Group. For over 25 years, Todd has helped some of the top charities in North America, assisting them in development of mission-driven marketing strategies. Todd is the author of a popular blog book, orgmarketing.com, and, and has also authored the free ebook, Nonprofit Websites, which has been downloaded by tens of thousands of charities in more than 15 countries. Todd writes the Fundraiser Confidential series for Fundraising Success Magazine and is also known for his Baker's Dozen series in the Nonprofit Times. Now, without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to my colleague and friend, Todd Baker. Thanks, Gabe, um, and welcome, everyone. Like you said, my name is Todd Baker. My role within Grizzard Communications is to help nonprofits grow, and so that's either in a uh, organization that comes to us in a brand new situation where maybe they've been experiencing flat or declining revenue or in an existing client relationship where um, our clients are experiencing a flat or declining revenue. I'll be asked to go in, assess the organization's strengths and weaknesses, and then create an account plan for them to grow um, over the next 24 to 36 months. So based on all of that experience, that's how we've created this presentation today for you. And uh, like I said, I'd like to start with the five most dangerous trends. Some of them are dangerous. Some of them are only dangerous if you don't do anything about them. For example, the first trend is corporate competition. Um, groups like Pepsi and Dove have um, created these nonprofit or philanthropic ventures in order to attract basically new people to their products. For example, um, two years normally do for the Super Bowl, and they said instead of creating a moment, they want to create a movement. And now they have 28 million people engaged in their refresh program. Dove, um, they, they are about helping young ladies inspire them and provide better self-esteem. An interesting thing is that when people have given to this campaign, they know that they're giving to Dove. So all this to say is that as, as the nonprofit sector, we really need to step up our game. Certainly we're not a Fortune 500 company and we don't have the budgets like a Fortune 500 company, but we really can't, uh, we really can no longer just ignore the fact that uh, being donor-centric and customer service oriented is, is critical in years to come to be able to just to be able to compete with the corporate competition. Trend number two is um, this concept of yesterday's marketing, where um, a lot of people think, well, if we, if we can just tell people how great we are, then that will convince them and we'll join them. Well, that's yesterday's thinking, yesterday's marketing. Today's marketing is getting other people to say how great you are. This slide here shows a consumer, consumer trust factor, and um, all of these indicators are much higher than your own marketing and communications, basically what you say about yourself. So if you even look here at the very bottom, which is reviewed by a blogger, um, 20, over 22% would believe a blogger that they don't even know um, and have, no, you know, have little confidence in over your own marketing hype. So we need to be understanding who these thought leaders are uh, around your specific cause and reaching out to them and getting people to say good things about who you are as an organization. Uh, this is by a New York economist, Paul Zak. He said basically, um, he's discovered for the first time that social networking triggers the release of generosity trust chemical in our brains. And that should be a wake-up call for every company. 
I often get asked, you know, should we be on Facebook? And I always say there's 500 million reasons why you need to be on Facebook. There's 500 million people on Facebook. And so to be able to find like-minded people to attract to your cause, they're there. And so you need to be there, but not just there. You just don't need to have a Facebook page or a Twitter page. It needs to be incorporated and integrated in everything you do and who you are. Another trend is this donor-centric marketing or concept. And, and um, one of the things that we've done at Grizzard recently is we analyzed 49,000 people who got this direct mail appeal. Only 67% of those responders came through the actual mechanism, the return device in the direct mail. So that means 33% of the gifts and the response came in different media. So what's important in this in this aspect is that if you mention just a single channel at a time, then you might be able to you might be making wrong assumptions that the direct mail is not working, um, or that uh, you know maybe it's not working as it used to be. Whereas you can see that almost half the revenue here um, came in through other channels. So. For example, I recently had a client that said, you know, hey, our direct mail is down by $250,000. So I asked him, uh, what about your overall revenue? And I'm sorry, everyone. We're experiencing some technical difficulties here. Um, if you don't, wouldn't mind uh, to bear with us for one minute here as we get this um, cleared up and get back and uh, running again. Just uh, again, just one minute here. Thank you. or downward, and it may not necessarily be channel specific any longer. That's an old way of measuring direct response. Today it's campaign focused, all the different touch points, and then collectively how did they do. Another trend is this funding gap that concerns us greatly. You have the senior donors that are, uh, you know, eternally lapsing, I guess you could say, and they, they would give because it was the right thing to do. Um, and now you have boomer donors that uh, basically are asking the question, what's in it for me? And so you have these boomer donors that haven't reached the, the live beginning level as the senior donors. And so as you can see, um, it, as it takes time for boomer donors to 
be best in your organization. And it takes different kinds of messaging to be able to engage these people. You have to uh, be able to ramp them up and also extend the senior donor giving as far as you can through claim giving strategies. The, the, uh, the more that you can close this gap, the, the more money you will realize and the less decline in revenue that you will realize. Trend number five that concerns me greatly is this growing number of family foundations. Many of major donors are forming these family foundations to focus their giving because they're losing faith in charities and they're looking for true partnerships and they want to maximize their tax benefit. Here's a quote from a donor in Chicago. She said, I really became frustrated with the fact that all I did was write a check after check to this charity or that charity without really feeling like it was part of me. At a certain point, you want to feel that connection. This person was overwhelmed. She started her own foundation in Africa and so forth. But what concerns me greatly is that from being uh, on the client side for 13 years at World Vision, I know that people that are writing the grants to foundations are in a different department normally than the major donor reps or the, uh, the marketing folks. And so if these major donors kind of fall off the radar, stop giving, that are giving through foundations that are not taking, uh, you know, solic solicited proposals, then there might be a chance where we lose these major donors. So we really have to stay in check with our grant writers and our foundation people to make sure that we don't lose track of these major donors. This donor, this donor could actually be on your file right now. This is what she's saying. Do you know me? Values are important. What I believe affects everything. You never ask me what I think. You don't know how I feel. There are distinct reasons why I donate. However, I can tell you don't have a clue. Today I got a newsletter. It talked about you, what you are doing here and there. I'm still wondering if you ever finished that hospital. Months ago, it seemed like a big deal. I gave. Do you really need me? I need to make my money out. Are you still a good investment? Don't tell me about your needs. Tell me about the needs you are meeting. My friend told me about a new charity. I attended their webinar. They asked me for my opinion. I gave it. Their Facebook informs me on breakthroughs. I heard about one of yours by then. I was impressed. I gave. They use technology to be more efficient. You use technology to ask for more money. They treat me like a partner in a noble cause. You treat me like an ATM machine. I haven't stopped giving just to you. You have to understand that your legacy does not guarantee you a place in the future. All of these brands and products that you're seeing right here existed 18 months ago, but no longer do. So what that tells me, and some of them are nonprofits that you'll notice. So what that tells me is that we really have to stay on the forefront. We have to think big because donors are about big visions. You know, stop testing blue versus red. That's not big. You've got eliminating homelessness, curing cancer, eradicating HIV AIDS. These are all big visions that people want to be a part of on how to present a vision. We have to stop tricking donors into reading our materials. We have to stop just throwing everything at them in the kitchen sink and hoping something sticks and hoping some hoping there's one thing that they care about most and that we we need to really understand that because they only did one thing about you, but you don't really know what that is. And you have to through research understand what your donors care most about that about and then carry that back to them each and every time you communicate with them. You have to stop implementing everything you read and hear at a conference, of course, except for this webinar. Um, you, what you want to do, you know, sometimes I, I talk to people and they say, yeah, we went to this most recent conference, which I, I'm saying conferences are good. But you just have to understand on how to implement what you hear. You know, some people say, well, we tested blue versus red and blue won. Well, what if you're the American Red Cross? You know, that doesn't translate. So just be careful when you hear certain things at conferences, you know, that you can't just whole, wholesale make a change. For example, the Chronicle of Philanthropy uh, wrote an article about 24 months ago that said they had done a research or quoting some research that said celebrities have no effect on people's ability to give. And, of course, this was on the hills of 
American Idol gives back where they raised 80 something million dollars in one in like just a few hours. So people will say one thing and do another. So it's, you can't just take information from a survey and then just implement what you think is going to work or even what's working for one organization. You have to be driven by saving lives rather than making money. I recently had a, a person walk into a, I was sitting in the boardroom and the president came in and said, so you're the, the money man, how much money are you going to raise me? And I said, well, how much money do you need to raise? I mean, whatever the money you need to raise to save the lives that you're, you're reaching and touching, that's what we'll raise, but it has to be driven by your cause and your mission, not because we think we can just make more money. People have more money to give. Right now, that's about uh, $300 billion that gives to charity every year. It's kind of flattened off the last couple of years, but before the recession, it had grown every year for the last 20 years. So that's still only 1% of our total economy. So 1% of our total economy is going to philanthropy. So what that tells me is that people have the capacity to give more, but they're not. I don't know if you've ever been to a Walmart where well, people are you know, going to those DVD bins and, and they're just finding another copy of Turner and Hooch. I mean, how many times can you watch Turner and Hooch? And I'm sure it might be only five bucks or $3.99, but the fact is that people have all this discretionary income and as collectively as a sector, we are failing to inspire them. We are failing to uh, encourage them to be about a big vision. So here's a, here's a formula to be able to present your cause and your vision and to get people excited about who you are and what you do. First thing you do is you present the need. This is the need that your organization addresses. This is, this is why your organization exists is because of you are addressing this specific need in your community or in your country or in your world. The second thing is what you're doing to respond to that need and making a clear case of your methodology and strategy on how to attack this need. Then the third thing you want to do is ask the donor to join you. You have to, you have to compel them and inspire them and, and show them and say, look, you are part of the solution. Not that the organization that you represent is a solution and we just need your money. No, that's the old way of thinking, the old, old way of doing things. It's the true partnership between the, the donor and the nonprofit is the only way this uh, issue or this need in society is going to be met. Then you have to build a case of why act now. With over a million and a half nonprofits in North, in North America, and it's growing every year, there's uh, a huge competition for that donor dollar. And you know, you may think, well, I'm a local school here, a uh, private school in this in Indianapolis, in Indiana, so I don't really have a lot of uh, competition. No, you do. You have a ton of competition. And so you always have to build a case of why does the donor want to give you money right now? And almost you have to address the question directly or indirectly why you're unique, why are you distinct uh, as an organization. You could be a rescue mission uh, and, and be and one distinct thing that you do is you keep entire homeless families together. And so if that's the case, if you're the only rescue mission in your community that does that, by letting people know in your communication and marketing by saying, hey, we're the only rescue mission in town, that keeps entire families together. Uh, you're not saying anything bad about the competition. You're just stating a fact, and you're building a case of why donors should give you money over some other shelter or other homeless group. And then what most people don't do well is basically tell a story of what would happen if you didn't exist. If you never existed or if this specific need is not addressed, what's going to happen? So. Uh, you know, that that's takes some thought, that takes some creativity, but it's also good to be able to let the donors know that's, you know, that's part of building the case. If, if we are not here, uh, you don't want to say, well, I guess everything would just be going on as normal. No. If you're not here, if you're not doing what you're doing, what's going to happen? It's probably not going to be positive. When I was at World Vision, we knew if we could take the donors to the field, that we had them for life, and that's engaging all of our senses, obviously taking a trip to Africa, spending the night in the village, being with the people that they've helped, um, seeing the 
the, the, the school that they helped fund or the well that they helped drill, whatever the donor's dollar went to do, we knew if the donor, if we took the donor to that uh, village and experienced that, that they would be loyal to us for life. And branding is like, uh, wine is like branding because it engages all of our senses. The first thing that the waiter does is he'll Oh, you know, take the cork out of the bottle, and what you're supposed to do with that cork is you're supposed to touch the cork on the end, and if it's soft and viable, then there's a chance that the wine is going to taste good. The second thing that the waiter does is, or the waitress, they'll pour a little bit in the glass, and then you're supposed to swirl the wine in the glass, and if you see streaks on the edge, on inside the glass, and sometimes people call them legs, if you see streaks coming down inside the glass, then that's a good sign that the wine's going to taste good. The next thing you're supposed to do is smell the wine, uh, and if the wine doesn't smell vinegary, that's a good sign that it's going to taste good as well. Then the next thing you're supposed to do is taste it, and obviously that's the true um, test is if you taste it and it tastes well, then you know that you've got a good bottle of wine. The last thing is that you um, make a toast, and the clashing of the glasses engages the sound. So wine engages all five senses, and that's really, if you can create marketing campaigns, and like I said, a vision trip, getting people to the actual front line of your organization, which engages all their senses, then you'll have greater loyalty. A lot of people don't know this, that there's a sixth sense of wine, and that usually happens when you've had too much the day after. Okay, we'll move on. I want to encourage you to stop being so excited when there's eight when you get an eight percent response rate to your marketing campaigns. I mean, sure, that's great, and a lot of people do get excited. But if you really want to grow and you want to think differently, and you need to think differently to be able to grow, you have to be consumed with the ninety-two percent that didn't respond. So. Good marketers know what works. You know, they can go to conferences and they can hear from other people that tested certain things and they'll come back and they'll say, hey, well, this works or that works or uh, asking for an email address this way uh, works more than that way and, or telling people to go online because the donation uh, will be put to work faster if that, that works, so we'll start doing that too. There's a lot of people copying each other. Um, so good marketers know what works, but great ones understand why they work. And so the only way that you become great and you grow um, by 27% one year is to understand why the 92% of the people are not growing or not giving. And really, every time you put a communication piece in front of a potential donor or a donor, this is what they're thinking. They're thinking, do I know you? How did you get my address? How can you prove what you say? Have I received this before? How can I trust you? I've already given to similar organizations, so why you, right? Can this wait? I can't afford to give much. These are all objections that your marketing and communication needs to address directly or indirectly, and you have to think through. Uh, you have to build a rationale of why people should give you money. Here's another reason. These are all other reasons why the 92%, they don't give you money. You know, for I won't go through all of them, but... For example, some donors that have a four or five year history of never giving you a gift in the summer, they're wondering why you continue to give them communication in the summer when they have this pattern of never giving you any money ever. Only will give you a gift at year end, and they've demonstrated that many years in a row, but yet uh, you haven't communicated with them uh, and, and ask them, hey, we noticed you've been giving every December. Can we put you on the newsletters and you know, cut your mail back and so forth? Because there's two ways to grow. You, you increase net revenue or you de decrease expenses. And really what you have to be doing is looking at both simultaneously in order to really grow exponentially. Um, some people only give money uh, when, when you've had an event. Um, some people only give to newsletters. Some people are wealthy. Some people are elderly. Some people never um, give to you China. And so why do you keep mailing them stuff about what you're doing in China? They don't want to know. They don't care. They only dig one thing about you, like I said earlier, and you've got to figure out what that is. You also have to be consumed with not only who you're communicating with, but who you're not communicating with. 
We recently had a client who had been uh, declining revenue for um, uh, several months. Um, I was asked to look at what we were doing. I noticed there was a segment of about 1,100 donors that had given a gift at least uh, $1,000. So it was a single largest gift at one time. They happened to be 37 months. They hadn't given a gift in 37 months, but uh, so they weren't, they weren't being mailed to. And so I asked them, I said, look, um, why aren't we mailing to these 1,100 people? Are, are clients experiencing kind of flat revenue, declining revenue? Um, do you realize, uh, account team, that this, is, this segment represents $1 million? A thousand times a thousand is a million. And here we are, we're sitting on this segment of people. Uh, obviously, their donor file is much larger than 1,100 people, but here is a segment that's worth a million dollars that we're not mailing, and we hadn't been mailing. Because of some, because of some segmentation, idea because somebody said 30 years ago uh, a donor becomes lapsed after 24 months therefore they they want a different uh, form of communication or a different strategy I don't know where this thinking came from but it's faulty it's not the absolute best thinking that you can do in order to determine who you mail and who you don't mail what's better is who's profitable to mail so, for example, these donors, if, if only one of, one of the 1,100 donors just gave one gift, what they had normally given in the past, they would, they would uh, cover the cost to mail this whole segment for 10 years. So we're not thinking, uh, we can't be thinking like an arbitrary date. For example, let me tell you, uh, for a $5 donor, as early as three months, they could be no longer profitable to mail. And so what you're going to do is you're going to mail that donor or communicate that donor, spend money on communicating to that donor for 21 more months because you're using this arbitrary date of 24 months. Whereas a $500 donor, they could be profitable to mail for 48 months, for four years. And then if you take this arbitrary date of 24 months, then you're going to cut them off two years too soon and leave a ton of money on the table. So a better way of thinking is who's profitable to mail, those people are your active donors. Who's not profitable to mail, those are your last donors. Uh, recently, um, uh, I had a client a few years ago where they, uh, uh, we were starting to work with them and they had identified, I, had, I had saw that they had about 350 names on a no mail ever flag. And so I sat down with the, 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 the client and I said, look, I want to go through each one of these 350 names with you and I want to know why um, there's these flags with no mail, no communication ever. So we would go through, it was painful, we would say, okay, tell me about the Thompsons. Oh, the Thompsons, yeah, well, they, they don't want any mail. If we ever mail them anything again, they're going to stop giving. Okay, that's, that's fine. Uh, what about the Johnsons? Oh, the Johnsons, oh, we don't know who the Johnsons are. We don't know how that flag got on their record. We don't know who they are. And I'd say, okay, well, let's put the Johnsons over here over to the left. And so we went through each name like that. We came up with 37 names that I, that no one could say, yes, those names, we know for sure that they are certain that they don't want to get any communication. So those 37 names, they ended up getting a letter. And we said to them right up front, we know we promised to never mail you, but the need is so great and we're going to mail you this one time. Those 37 donors raised $453,000. And the Nonprofit Times wrote up a case study about this uh, program. Now, I will tell you this, to be fair, there was one gift in there for $400,000, which is an anomaly, of course. But the fact is that the other 36 donors raised $53,000, which is pretty amazing. All that to say, we would have never even gotten a dime if we would have continued on with the strategy that had been in place before we got there. So you need to be thinking and understanding who are we not communicating with and why. Again, this is, the, this is part of the 92%. Um, understanding of why the people that are, you are communicating with are not giving, and then people that are sitting on your file, 
These are just assets sitting there, like that million-dollar segment, just not being communicated with. These are assets that your organization, that the, your client has, or the nonprofit has. And you've got to say, how can we utilize all of the assets and leverage everything that we have at our disposal? Um, recently, there was an organization that had 58,000 lapsed donors. So, who, how do you know, in a prudent way? You know, we've been communicating with these names, um, and they're no longer profitable to mail. So, how do we know? Who's ready to raise their hand? If you if you can't telemarket these people, if you can't do some create a handwritten package, some of these strategies that we know that work the best to uh, to reactivate a lapsed donor, you know how would you know what to do and who to who to? Where's the cream? I guess I could say that you can skim from the top of these fifty eight thousand names because not everybody um, is in the same situation. Some people you know, obviously are ready to give again. And I will tell you, if you've ever done any focus groups with your donors or been involved with focus groups, you'll know that donors, they don't label themselves. Uh, you, you know, you're sitting behind a two-way mirror and you know that donor sitting in there talking to the facilitator hasn't given a gift to your organization for four years. But when they're asked, hey, are you a donor of this organization? They'll say, oh, yeah, I give. I give to them. So they're not labeling themselves as a current or lapse or active donor. These are labels that we've put on them, but that's not the way they think. So there are people out there that are ready to give you a gift, but you've got to know who. So what we've done is we have a, a lifestyle segmentation strategy, and not to get really complicated here, but people that are what's called, we call the multi-year donor, these are donors that had given three years in a row to your organization. Those tend to be your very best and most loyal donors. Well, out of these 58,000 names, there certainly could be ex-multi-year donors. So how does a person become an ex-multi-year donor? Well, they once had given you a gift in three years in a row, but maybe for the last couple of years or four years, they're giving, they just stopped giving you a gift at all together. So that's a good place to start. And reactivating lapsed donors for people that are no longer profitable to mail. And obviously, um, you want to always be mailing your major donors, uh, people that have given you a gift, a significant gift in the past. And like I said already, just one gift from any one of those major donors will help cover the cost to mail those donors for years to come. That's why you keep mailing those people. You may only get one gift every time you mail your major donors, and it could be a $5,000 gift. But I guarantee you, you would have not gotten that $5,000 gift if you didn't mail that group. One of the things that you have to understand is in, in metrics, there's a lot of uh, good applications, good software programs that are producing reports. But you have to understand that getting, uh, knowing what to a measure is just as important as getting the metrics right. A lot of groups are using short-term metrics to make long-term marketing decisions. Let me give you an example. This is a uh, this is a graph that's called long-term value by first gift. There, we've analyzed and proven that there's a direct correlation with the donor's first gift and their long-term value to your organization, which makes sense, I would think. You know, if I give you $100, my value over three years or five years is probably going to be greater than the person that gives you a $10 gift initially. This graph, let me explain what it is. On the left side is the cumulative value. It starts at zero and it goes all the way up to $800. The numbers on the uh, horizon line are the number of months since point of acquisition of this um, of this donor. So it goes out from the first month to the 37th month, so three years. And you can see these uh, lines all represent groups of donors. Um, the, you know, from one penny to less than $10, $10 to less than 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, et cetera, and it goes all the way up. And you can see what I just said, that uh, depending upon their first gift, there's a direct correlation with their three-year value. that in this particular situation, all the donors that gave less than $20 initially, uh, this organization never broke even. So why is this important? This is important because most people uh, measure acquisition based on initial results. They say, well, we need 10,000 names to maintain 
or even just maintain our current donor file, or we need 12,000 to maintain and to grow by 2,000 every year. So they say, okay, hey, did we get our 12,000 names? Absolutely, we got 12,000 names, so we're doing well. Well, are you? What if 8,000 of those names gave you a gift less than $20? What ended up happening is you, you ended up losing money over three years. Um, and this doesn't even account for the cultivation cost. This is just the point of acquisition. Uh, so you could see that when you acquire a low-value donor, it actually costs you more money. So what many organizations are doing is lowering their ask amounts in acquisition. Instead of starting at 20, they're going to start at 10. Because they think, hey, more the merrier. No, oh, that's not true. More than more is not the merrier. Because you don't want these low-value donors on your on your organization. Now, this this graph, you would have this analysis, you would have to analyze for yourself. You can't just use this graph and say, well, this is going to work for us. You would have to conduct this analysis on your own organization. But I bet that would be that you would find similar findings in that. Um, there is a point, a dollar point, that if you know you get less than that, you probably are going to have a difficult time of getting a second gift from that donor or breaking even over time with that donor. And the, the key is to under, understand that price point, I'd say. Um, and for this particular nonprofit, it was $20. So you don't want to be lowering your ask amounts lower than you know that price point that you, that's going to be um, a positive uh, a positive donor and a quality donor. So it's really about getting quality donors over quantity donors. That's what you want. Here's another example. It's called long-term value by list. And these are 10 rented lists. Um, and again, the cumulative value over, over uh, is up to $200. Uh, then the, number, the horizon line is the number of months since point of acquisition. Now, why is this important? This is important because if you can see the very worst line at the point of acquisition, the, the worst test list, uh, ends up being the very best donors over 37 months. But if you're only looking at, if you're only saying, how do we measure uh, our lists? Uh, and, and all these lists represent 10,000 names each. So you're trying to understand, okay, how do we, how do we find new lists? How do we roll out with uh, more and more potentially like-minded people to organization. Well, if you're looking at this initial result and you're determining what list to rent, and you say, well, okay, the green list at the very bottom that was, it was the worst performing list, we will never rent that again. If you're only looking at the initial analysis, unless you're doing this kind of analysis, uh, you're just not going to know that you're throwing away quality lists and actually keeping and rolling out lists that are marginal or even worse performing lists. Because you can see the highest performing list ends up being about a marginal list in the middle of the pack. And you could say, well, if this was the best performing list. We want to roll out. Maybe there's a universe of 200,000 names. And so you're, you know, you're spending all this money on these marginal lists, these marginal prospects, when all the time you've abandoned the very best quality names. So you know, you're probably thinking, well, how do we how do we know this? Do we wait three years? No, you don't wait three years. You, in about eight months, you're going to make those decisions when you're going to rent lists again. So if you look at the eighth month here on this graph, that's the seven, that's the line between seven and nine. You can see that that green line, though it's not surpassed all of the other lists, though it has moved up significantly, that you probably would at least, at a minimum, retest the list. You wouldn't abandon it altogether. And then if you look out 16 months, then you could see, wow, that green list is now the second best list or tied for the second best. And you would say, that, that list we need to roll out. So the key is, and I'll just leave this, uh, leave this with you, you don't want to be making marketing decisions off information that's older than six months. So if somebody presents uh, a marketing plan uh, and, and says, look, uh, this is what we want to do. And you say, well, how, how did you come to that conclusion based off what? Well, here's the report. And if it's older than six months, then you'd say, let's update the report. We've got to update this information because we don't want to be making long-term marketing decisions based on information that's older than six months. 
Um, and we had a client when we first started working with them, they equally did acquisition um, a quarter of a million dollars in each one of these seasons. And we just intuitively knew that you can't be generating equal, the equal amount of quality of donor uh, in each one of these seasons. So we ran the long-term value by season and realized there are a significant difference between fall and winter. And so uh, we had recommended moving the winter money into the fall. And it makes it a lot easier when you have this information to know, like, we want quality donors, we want the best quality donors. I think, you know, somebody saying, well, we'll just we'll divvy up the budget equally, you know, that's fine, but that doesn't take a lot of thought. And, and, uh, and so what you want to do is be maximizing your expense for revenue purposes. And this is just a long-term value by media. Um, we found, um, this is a Salvation Army, this is actually a, a five-year study that uh, we had conducted, and it's now, I think, seven years old. But you can see that uh, if you get people to call the 800 number, their long-term value is twice as much as just direct mail only. And uh, that's mo most of that reason is getting the credit card Paying, getting someone to put the, the donation on the credit card. One of the things, we're running almost running out of time, but one of the things I definitely want to talk to you about is uh, the offer. I just gave this presentation a few days ago, and there was uh, quite a few people in the room. I asked them, the, do you know what an offer is? And one person raised their hand. And so um, the offer uh, actually is the core of your fundraising strategy. Every campaign that I've analyzed that didn't work is because they either didn't have an offer or it was poorly constructed. And every campaign that I've analyzed that was very successful had a very strong offer. And basically the offer is, is this. It equals your program budget plus your administrative costs. So let's say you um, feed, let's say you have $100,000 set aside to feed kids an after school program. Well, that's great. That's not what you need to raise, though. You need to raise that plus your administrative costs. So if your administrative costs, your overhead is 20%, then you go out to your donor file and say, we need to raise $120,000. Because if you're just only raising program uh, budgets, then you're actually going to lose money every time you <laughs> raise money because you're not making enough money to cover your program or your overhead. And then you divide that by lives impacted over time. So, for example, if um, you know, wanted to reach 1,000 kids uh, every day, then you need to divide the program budget and the administrative costs into that 1,000 kids every day for a month or a week, whatever that is. But this is, uh, this is a, a core formula for you to understand, and you may end up constructing five or six different offers for all of your programs within your organization, and that's okay. But, again, your donors uh, are probably most uh, interested in one particular offer, and, and but yet you maybe continue to present uh, just a bunch of information to them all the time, hoping one thing strikes a chord. One of the things, uh, being at World Vision, is I think one of the strongest offers, and I'm currently writing an article right now for the Nonprofit Times, and it's looking at the, the best offers in the last 50 years. And I think that the child sponsorship offer is probably, well, definitely going to be uh, in the top 13, the Baker's doesn't. But uh, the reason why I think uh, that this is a strong offer isn't probably what you initially think. Now, many people think, oh, it's that one-to-one -one, uh, interaction with the kid. Well, I can tell you, for everybody that thinks that's great, we had people tell us, I don't want to be a sponsor because I don't want to have that responsibility. I don't want to be committed, having another mouth to feed. I don't want to feel bad if I don't give. So uh, that's not the main motivating factor of why that is strong. Here's why I think it's strong. And this is going to be definitely replicable for you. I believe that the child sponsorship offer is one of the strongest offers in the last 50 years is because it invades culture. It becomes part of that family's household tradition. It sits on the coffee table. It's on the refrigerator. It gets taken into the, uh, the prayer time of the family. It, it, it gets um, talked about at Thanksgiving. It, the picture folder sits on the, the dinner table. It becomes part of that family's culture. And any time you can create 
marketing strategies and campaigns and offers that become part of a person's culture, you will uh, create loyalty and a bond with that donor beyond you can even imagine. Another issue that I think, and uh, we're going to wrap it up pretty soon so we can get these questions in, but, um, but another, another uh, issue I recently I see right now is how we write. And, and um, one of the things I do for our, our organization is I'll look at creative that, uh, from organizations that are having issues and they're wanting to become clients. And so the first thing I do is I look at their creative, creative and I analyze um, from what perspective, what point of view are they writing this from? This is, a, this is from a movie, The Shipping News, and Kevin Spacey is wanting to be a reporter. And so this gentleman is telling him, look, uh, here's, how you, here's how you become a reporter. Let me give you some advice. Look at the horizon and tell me what you see. Give me a headline in a sense. Kevin Spacey says, horizon fills with dark clouds. And then the older gentleman instructs him, no, it's intimate storm threatens village. And Kevin Spacey says, well, what if there is no storm that comes? And then his reply was, village spared by deadly storm. So that's kind of humorous. In, the, in that movie, it's really funny. Uh, but it's one of those things where when I look at creative and how the perspective of how we're writing or how other groups are writing, I am really take a critical eye. Because one of the things that we want to do with donors is build empathy and sympathy. Recently, I was reading. Um, some creative uh, that uh, an organization had been had been doing. They weren't a client yet, but they didn't know why things were flat and declining. And so I read, and they work with the homeless. So I read some of their headlines and their stories. And this was a headline out of their newsletter: "I'm addicted to drugs." Well, what this does is it actually plays into the stereotypes of what a lot of people feel about the homeless, that they're, these are people that have made poor choices in their life and they have no one else to blame but themselves. Okay? That's, that's a stereotype that we don't want to play into when we're trying to build empathy and sympathy when we're writing to raise money from people. So when I read the story, about three-fourths of the story into it, this person was a Gulf War veteran. And to me, that's what you lead with. You lead with the fact that a war hero still battles. Because what does that do? I mean, it's, it has integrity. It's still part of the story. It's just what do we lead with and how we, what point of view do we write from? And uh, we want to build that empathy and sympathy. And we, um, another issue that I see in writing, in, uh, writing uh, factually based or what I say for like a newspaper and then or direct response in a compelling way. I see this a lot in writing and mostly it's because and I see this a lot on when I look at digital communication. You know, when you write for a newspaper, there's uh, there's something implied there. The fact is there is no relationship implied. When I pick up the USA today, I don't expect uh, it to be written toward me as a person. I, I just reading the facts. I'm reading about what happened in Joplin uh, over the weekend, and it's a factual. I'm not involved. It doesn't use the word you. I'm just reading factually based. But in direct response to fundraising, this is you're writing to a person that just didn't give you money, but that they actually are a critical element of why you were successful as an organization. And so writing in a compelling way and an engaging way that says to the donor, you've done a good thing, uh, and let me tell you how you've done this, uh, it's not factually based. You know, a lot of the writing I see today is just all factual based, and it's not going to compel you to, to give. Donate now is not compelling. But why do you need to donate now? That's compelling. Um, Gabe, I think I'm going to stop and let's go ahead and, and uh, get some questions in. Sure, Todd. And, and, and I will say this, that uh, the entire presentation will be put up on the grizzard.com website. And, uh, and so, and what's that? Oh, okay, I'm going to go to, I'm going to scroll down here and skip a lot of stuff. But do we have a question? Yes, we do. Um, Todd, well, thank you so much for walking us through this and uh, a lot of powerful and informative uh, information for all of us to look through. And I'd like to, you know, thank everyone for bearing with us as we uh, went through 
some technical difficulties there, and I realized that the audio quality wasn't up to par as to what we were expecting, but I hope that things weren't too bad to understand, and I hope that um, you know, when you receive a copy um, of the presentation, you can go back and refer to any uh, part of Todd's presentation you uh, want to. Yeah, feel free to uh, feel free to contact me directly um, via email if, if there's a slide that you want me to go over with you uh, at an individual basis. I'd be more than happy to do that. Great, thanks. Um, now I'd like to take a few minutes, and there's a couple of questions that came up during our session. Uh, the first one being from uh, Chris Valetti, and I apologize if I am uh, mispronouncing uh, your name, uh, but he asks, uh, "What advice do you have for smaller outposts of larger organizations? Should we make?" out a marketing plan and things like that. So I think he's really speaking to maybe some of the smaller uh, regional offices maybe, you know, of a larger, bigger organization or some, um, you know, things of that nature. Well, I think that uh, uh, if they're a part of a, if they're a, an affinity group or a separate 501c3 or if they're a chapter of a larger national headquarters, one of the things that you want to make sure you're doing is staying in step with the national office, making if they're creating materials or video or some things that, uh, as a regional or local-based uh, chapter, that you couldn't simply afford to do. Make sure you're leveraging all that all that communication and staying in step there, especially if they're engaged in some kind of advertising campaign that's building uh, awareness about the organization. So you want to leverage that as much as possible. But where a local group can be a lot uh, more effective than some national office that's trying to you know, manage an entire country uh, offices is in, in your major donor program, making sure that you, uh, those donors that have given you a gift, maybe 500 and above or $250 or above, that you know every one of those and that you've invited them down to your office or invited them to where uh, your organization is doing its work um, you know, and, and making sure that you know them well because that's something that can't be done from a national headquarters perspective. And, and once you have a bond and a close relationship with those major donors and that affinity that's strong with your local office, and they're probably engaged because of the locality of, of the organization, then that's the number one thing that you should be doing. All right. Well, thank you, Todd. And I hope that answers your question, um, Chris, or maybe touches on some of the things that you need to be doing. Uh, next on uh, our list is a message from Vicki Grove. And she was asking, what are the pros and cons of a print newsletter versus an e-newsletter as far as donor response is concerned? Well, one of the things that you have to understand is that it's, we're not in an either-or society anymore. We're in a society of convenience, and um, you want to offer both because you have some donors that like the print version. A lot of donors will tell you, I just love to sit down in my chair and hold this thing and read it at my leisure, as opposed to when they're at work and they get an email in their inbox, uh, they're just trying to rush through content because they're, they're trying to, even at night when I'm The fact is, is that you need to you need to be working with your top 100 donors. So if you understand who those top 100 people are, and you know their giving levels from year to year, and you can stay on top of that, and know that look, I know that uh, uh, Hugh Hugh Hepner he he has uh, ended up uh, giving us a hundred dollars last year, and now he's not giving us a hundred dollars, and so I'm going to go talk to Herb and, and find out what's going on. So you've got to stay on top of those hundred donors. 
Okay, well, thanks, Todd. I appreciate that. And I think we had um, another issue with the audio again, so I apologize if uh, you weren't able to hear Todd's response. Um, but again, you know, please feel free to contact Todd directly, and maybe you could have that conversation regarding the newsletters or any other questions you might have. I do, we do have time for a couple more, so I hope that um, everyone is still able to to hear us, or at least we're back. And um, there's a question from Peter uh, Whalen. Todd, and he wanted you to expand on your comments on invading culture. Okay. So if you could elaborate on that for a little bit. Well, um, culture is, you know, sometimes we think of culture in, in, in the big big form of, of a country or, or a neighborhood or a, a city. It really, culture is uh, in the home, and it's about uh, what goes on uh, in that house, and if you can create campaigns or co uh, strategies that become part of it, and I say the word invade, but really, um, it's really becoming part of that culture. You know, maybe it's giving them uh, uh, three, three or four ideas on how to use your marketing piece. Um, sometimes that works very well, where you say, "Look, uh, we're going to." We're giving you this involvement device, and here's what you can do with it. You can, uh, when your family has dinner, make it part of your nightly meal or morning meal, or uh, have your child take it to school and, and do a, t a show and tell or whatever. Uh, but giving them ideas on how to use your marketing piece uh, and your communication piece as part of their culture will help you as well. Will help the donor understand, like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Well, thank you for elaborating on that. <laughs> and I think we just have time for one more question. I apologize. Uh, this is coming from uh, Carlene Byron. And she uh, mentions that she has a very concentrated donor base. 10% um, give 50% of her total, um, I'm assuming, income. And 1% give 30%. Should I be pleased or anxious? Well, I really don't. I'd have, probably have to know more about your specific nonprofit. Um, if it's a um, if it's a nonprofit that is working uh, in a humanitarian capacity, I would be very concerned for you. But if it's like uh, a nonprofit that has a very, um, uh, I would say, highly educated um, offer. So it has, it's very elevated that only a certain number of people or elite uh, business-minded people understand and get. You probably will never have a mass base of donors. Uh, so it's one of those things I'd probably have to know more about the organization. But typically, uh, that's not a healthy mix. Uh, but I don't want to say, I don't want to jump to that conclusion without knowing exactly what, what they're doing as an organization. Okay, well, thanks, um, Todd, and I appreciate your time, everybody's time. Um, at this time, uh, I just wanted to mention I hope everybody found this inform uh, session informative and helpful. I know we've touched on a lot today, and should any ha anyone have any additional questions or comments, please feel free to contact us via the information listed on your screen. Um, I know we had a couple of uh, technical difficulties and hiccups, so I hope they didn't deter from what uh, you know we were really trying to, the information we were trying to get across to everybody. Um, we, I had mentioned this to a couple people on our question um, uh, board here, and uh, we will um, try to post a copy of this presentation and email link out to all participants within a few days. Uh, this will allow everybody to go back and reference any part um, that um, was missed or anything you want to go back and look at and reference. And again, feel free to um, contact us with any questions that you might have regarding those um, uh, parts of the, per uh, the presentation. And I'd like to thank everyone again for their time. And uh, please check your email uh, for any future um, invitations that might come from Grizzard webinars. And uh, I promise that the audio um, hiccups will be cleared up by this. We'll make it much more uh, enjoyable. I promise that. Thank you, and uh, have a great day. Am I out?
surfaces are actually printed on those surfaces. So they're lower quality. So that's all the time. And also with O2, it would just, there were two times it would obviously be something out. 